Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Gord McCall. I'm the Artistic and Executive Director of the Lyric Theatre here in downtown Swift Current, Saskatchewan. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our second edition of our Lyric Digital Stage Write Out Loud presentation. We have again tonight a flight of four wonderful authors for you to listen to, so we'll get to that as quickly as we can. In 1980, I um, discovered a book called The Computer and the Second Self. I think it was written by Shelley Turkle, if I remember the name. And uh, in the 80s was the introduce, introduction sorry, of the home computer for the first time, really, in quantity. And so we all had them, and we were learning very quickly what a new world it was. Well, in Shelley's book, she talked about something called baud rate, B-A-U-D rate. It's the rate at which the computer screen scrolls. You'll notice it today on your iPhones or your Android phones when you scroll the screen, how quickly you do it and how you seem to pick up the words that you need to see so that you can stop at the place you need to be. Well, that never was the case in years gone by. So what's happened? Our brains have adapted, adapted to a new digital universe. And there's pluses to that and some minuses. As you know, uh, just recently, Cursive Script has been reintroduced to some schools. Cursive Script handwriting uh, was eliminated from school curriculums, obviously because everyone felt we were in this new digital world and it was now becoming obsolete. The issue with that, I found, was that when you eliminate Cursive Script, meaning that you usually have to write on something by hand, you actually have eliminated a thought process that is quite precious. Because when you write cursive script, you write more slowly. It gives you time to think about what you're actually saying. Now we have editors on our computers so that we can write anything, and then we go back and we spell check and we edit and we do all of these things that actually we were never able to do so easily in the past. So that's one thing. Our brains have evolved with this baud rate of thinking. And the other thing that's changed is our language. As you notice, when people text, they don't use the English language as it was in the day when cursive script was dominant. So what does all this lead to? It leads to the fact that uh, listening to authors uh, read their works or us reading their works allows our brain to slow down and enjoy the pleasure of the words and the ideas that are being exchanged with us. And, you know, I have found that uh, a prophecy didn't come true. People said that books were going to become obsolete when computers took hold. Guess what? They haven't. And we are so much the better for that. So, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we have a flight of four authors who are going to present some of those precious words and give us time to actually allow us to visualize what they're saying in our mind's eye, as opposed to a computer giving us the images all the time. Now, final irony is we're presenting this on the digital airwaves because we've lost the ability to, for the moment, to collect uh, together in groups and actually have one-on-one -on -one live communication. So it's always an ironic world that we live in. Okay, without further ado, let's sit back and enjoy some of those golden words. I'm going to pass the proceedings on to Terry Taves, who is on the Write Out Loud committee, and she will introduce tonight's event for us. Sit back, relax, and enjoy, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you being, for being here. Thanks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Write Out Loud, the COVID-19 physically distanced version. We are part of the new online Lyric Digital Stage program, and we're happy to be part of it. I am Terry Taves, and I'm a member of the Write Out Loud Committee for the Lyric Theatre in Swift Current, Saskatchewan, the Little Theatre on the Prairies. Until we can meet again personally at the Lyric, we, as the committee, are so pleased to be able to bring you this online version of a Write Out Loud event. I hope you are staying safe and healthy. And thank you, our audience, for being here with us for our, our online Write Out Loud event. Enjoy. Okay. My name's Harold Johnson. I've been asked to participate in the Lyric Theatre. little project going on here. I'm going to thank 
uh, Terry and Gordon for including me. Very grateful to the Lyric Theater. When I was down in Swift Current, they treated me really well. So this is giving a little bit back. We're in some hard times. We're in the middle of COVID. Everything I've written in the last while has been really heavy stuff about alcohol and the justice system. But a young man who was killed and eaten by wolves was my last book. That's pretty heavy stuff. And I don't want to burden you with heavy stuff. So I'm going to read to you from my favorite book that I've ever written. And it's called Charlie Musgrave. Charlie was the most fun that I ever had writing a book. I started out with a simple idea and got into it. And then Charlie took over. And I swear, I channeled this guy. He's real. He's out there. He's somewhere. And he wrote this book for me. I'm going to start at the beginning so I don't have to introduce too much. But by the time I finished writing this book, Charlie was a good friend of mine. Thelma scares the shit out of me. It's not that she ever talks to me or that when she looks at me, her face indicates her extreme disgust. My wife's big sister is two years younger than Lois. Thelma weighs over 400 pounds and no one dares call her fatty. That woman does not have an ounce of fat on her body. Not that I've ever seen her body. I just know. I know because when she carries in firewood, she carries nearly a quarter of a cord at a time. When she splits wood, stand back. If her half then goes in the ditch, she drags it out, pushes it back straight on the road, then bends the springs when she squeezes back behind the steering wheel. This story is not about Thelma, but it all started when Lori told me that Thelma was coming to visit again. It was not that Thelma was coming to visit that starts this story, but that we were low on meat. The moose I shot last fall was not going to be enough to feed that woman. Lala wanted me to go shoot another moose. In the middle of winter, I tried to find a way out. Morris gets moose all winter. Ask him how he does it. I was stuck. Morris did get moose in winter. He gave most of it away. Maybe I could get out of hunting yet. Maybe Morris would donate a hind quarter to help feed Thelma. I'm out. Morris turned his palms upward. Why are you asking? You're as good as a hunter. You're as good a hunter as I am. Deep snow, cold. Walk for days out there, not see anything. Do like I do. Just drive along the road. When I see a moose, I shoot through the window of the truck. Just don't get excited and forget to open it first. So I did. I went road hunting. It was a little embarrassing, driving down the road with my rifle on the seat beside me a thermos of coffee and a bag of cheesies. I really hoped my ancestors were not watching, eh, but I knew they were. I felt their disapproval. Eh, at, least I was a no, uh, at least I was alone. No one would be telling stories about me. Lisa did not have to know how I got the moose. She wouldn't ask. But I'd have to tell the story of the hunt, the hunter's story, how the tricky moose tried to outsmart me or how he gave himself in sacrifice. Maybe I could leave out the part about the truck. Lola would not ask for details. She didn't want to hear the story more than once anyway. And I think she only tolerates the stories because it's tradition. Lola likes tradition. It has grown on her. My best excuse for whenever, whatever I need to get away with is to blame it on tradition. It goes back to when we met. Alcatraz. We occupied the famous island prison and no one cared. We didn't even get a headline. Indian takes... Indians take back the rock. I don't remember why. I was in California in the first place. It was that time. Wine was 50 cents a gallon if we drove inland and the old van made it there and back to the beach. Somebody had an idea. A radical idea. We all wanted to be radical back then. So we joined the occupation. I was far from home. No one would know. I would not embarrass my family. Those were my freedom thoughts back then. As soon as I stepped off the boat onto the rock, someone recognized me. Charlie Muskrat, what the hell are you doing here? Imagine that. I was thousands of miles away from home, 
And whom do I meet? Someone from my hometown. And my hometown was only a couple of hundred people up at the north end of Montreal, Lake Saskatchewan. Not that there was a hometown left either. The government moved the town across the lake and renamed it Reaquin. All that was left in the old town were the mounds of dirt and collapsed cellar holes where the houses once stood. As it happens when people from the same place meet far away from home, they hang out with each other. That's what happened. Mary and I just started hanging out together. And we never stopped. The only thing I wish that had happened differently is that I wish I had not tried so hard. I had not tried to be so hard to get. Mary was not trying to get me. I remember that much, but not much more. I'm going to have trouble remembering your name. It doesn't mean anything other than I have a poor memory for names, I told her. And damned if after that show-off statement that meant I had so many women in my life that I could not keep them straight, I'd ha I've had trouble remembering Lorna's name ever since. I don't rightly remember how we got from Alcatraz back home. It took a while. Montana was in there somewhere. I remember that much. I don't remember when Louise became my girlfriend or even when she started calling herself my wife or when I started calling her my wife. Shame of shame, I do not remember when we first made love or when I first bought her flowers. She does. She remembers exact years, dates, and even the time. Teases me with it. Remember the first time we made love? Uh, uh-huh. Tell me again what you told me that morning. Uh, don't you remember? I remember. I just want to hear it again. Then I'm stuck. And she laughs and hugs me and kisses my forehead like I'm a little boy and walks around with a big smile, all bright again. I remember some things, important things, like when we stood on the shore of the lake and looked out over the overgrown old place. I want to live here, she said, just like that. And I said, okay and started pacing off an area to build our house. That's how it's been. I don't know how many years we've been together, but they've all been like that. For a long time, I think we were just friends. We came and went and came and went and were always happiest when we were together. We did not decide to live together, we just did. It was either she did not go home or I did not go home or we both went home together. There must have been a time when we were boyfriend and girlfriend, but I don't remember. I don't remember when it started or when it ended. Do you remember the first time you told me you loved me? Uh-huh. Tell me again what you said that afternoon. Uh, don't you remember? I remember. I just want to hear it again. Laughs, hugs, kisses, and smiles. I do remember that we never had a ceremony, that we never made a commitment, that we are not married in white man law or in Indian law. I think we started calling each other husband and wife after other people started calling us that. It's okay, sir. Your wife already paid for the gas. No, we've been together for so long that we know what each other is thinking. Like the other night when I was skinning a muskrat with a dull knife. And Flora brought me the sharpening stone I was wishing I had handy. We never talk about leaving it all we never talked about leaving it all behind and living away. There was no discussion about luxury or the lack of luxury. We just moved into the house we built together. Ate from the garden we planted. I trap and hunt and get along and she works sometimes when we need money. But mostly we don't need money and we just get along. Wanda and, Wanda and I have never had a fight. Not once have we ever argued. Not that I remember anyways. She wants to do something and I help. She says we need wood and I get the axe. She says we need water and I walk down to the lake with the buckets. She says we need meat and I go hunting. I think we are getting old now. My youngest brother just turned 40. The baby of the family is 40. He grew to be the biggest of us all. He keeps reminding of us of that and that he's over six feet tall and weighs over 200 pounds. We say that is because when we were young, we had to get off the tit when the next baby came along. He got the nurse until he was in grade eight. Even so, we're all getting older. All of us except Wilma. She still looks as good as always. More importantly, she acts like she's 21. Keeps me laughing. But I am getting older. I know because things hurt now joints and muscles and things like that. I can still walk 20 miles a day checking traps and such, but the next day it's hard to get out of bed. Harriet makes the fire on those mornings and puts extra cinnamon in the oatmeal and lots of raisins. What's really strange about having graying hair is that younger people ask me for my opinion. I know enough to know that I don't know a hell of a lot. I usually answer by telling the asker 
a story. That's strange too. I remember stories. Well, this story is about what happened when I went road hunting. I didn't have much of a chance to actually hunt. No sooner had I set out on what was to become an adventure, I picked up a hitchhiker. The old gravel highway that runs down the east side of Montreal Lake occasionally has hitchhikers. Trappers and such on the way to Larange. That sort of thing. I know all of these people and I'm used to providing rides. Passing on messages or taking a list and a few dollars with me to pick up something someone ran out of. He was standing on the side of the road. I took my rifle under the seat and pulled over. Today's hitchhiker was a stranger. Asked me the usual questions. Where are you going? What's your name? Who are you related to? Down the road a ways. My name is uh, Wesley. Yeah, Wesley. Wesley Jack, that's my name. Who am I related to? Well, let me see. Do you know? Um, um, he scratched at the mat of tangled gray hair that showed from under his toque. Well, I guess I'm related to just about everyone. No need to push things, I figured. Anyone who is unsure of his name must have a reason to be vague. Well, that's where I'm going to, just down the road a ways. I didn't have to tell him I was road hunting. Maybe I was just going for a ride. Maybe I was just going to check my rabbit snares down the road a ways. What's your mum's name, Charlie? Wesley Jack asked me. Her name's Roberta, Roberta Muskrat. Her mum was Rose and her grandma was Catherine. There. I had told enough history and genealogy to place me properly in this world. I belonged here on this highway. My family had been in this area for many generations, but I did not remember telling Wesley my name was Charlie. I tried humor. Best way to make a friend I always found was with laughter. Make someone laugh and their defenses go down. Something about laughing. It's always easier to do when it's shared. I tried gentle teasing. Wesley Jack. Are you, are you related to Whiskey Jack, Black Jack, or Wisaki Jack? It worked. Wesley cackled loud and long, turned a long-toothed smile at me. Can't put nothing over on you, Charlie, and cackled some more. I laughed, too. It was easier to laugh with this man. Suddenly, my anxieties were gone. I felt new. Wesley felt like a relative, one that I hadn't, had not seen in a long, long time. So, Charlie, I always wanted to know. How's your dad? Oh, I haven't heard from him in a long time. Went back south years ago. I don't even know if he's still alive or not. I answered all relaxed and easy. So relaxed that I wanted to smoke. I offered one to Wesley. He took it, sniffed the tobacco in, and sincerely said, Thank you. That was an odd thing to do. Almost ceremonial. But everyone has their own reaction to tobacco. I offered coffee from the thermos. Apologized for not having water. I did not have food out there. I offered some of my leftover cheesies from the half-empty bag. Wesley drank the coffee, commented on its excellent flavor. Dark roast, I explained, perked on a wood stove. This is good, Charlie. Wesley washed down the cheesies with the coffee. How are you doing for gas? He asked as he leaned over and tapped the gas gauge. About half a tank, a little better maybe. Should get me where I'm going. Yeah, it should, Wesley agreed. I think I'll get out about here. Here was nowhere. Nobody lived near here. This was just an old gravel road and muskeg on both sides for the next couple of miles. A good place to expect to see a moose in the summer. Are you sure? Yeah, this is a good spot. Hope I didn't insult you with that whiskey jack comment. Nah, that was good. You did good, Charlie. Don't worry about a thing. I'll see you again sometimes. It seems strange, but who am I to tell someone where to get off? I figured I'd just keep hunting, and I'd probably see him again when I came back this way with the moose in the back of the truck. Snow bent the trees along the road, arched them over away from the thick of the forest. The road was hard packed, the best part of winter driving. No mud, no ruts. Thunder cruised along, his tires sung with the crunch of snow, and that's where I'll end for now. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Hope you enjoyed Charlie Muskrat as much as I enjoyed writing him. Have a good day. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Lavadier and I'm thrilled to be here today 
uh, sharing some of my writing with you as part of Write Out Loud, which is a component of Lyric Theatre's digital stage. Today I'll be reading two short lyric essays, both of which are included in my forthcoming debut collection of essays called Scraps, A Life in Piecework. Um, you can find links to my writing, these essays and lots of other short stories and essays and poems at www.rachelavadier.com. Uh, my first piece is called Home is Beyond the Horizon and those of you from Swift Current will definitely uh, understand a lot of the landscape that is in this piece. All right, <clears throat> Home is Beyond the Horizon. I wince at the bright sunlight reflecting off freshly fallen snow and focus on my mucklucks crunching across my mother's driveway. Each inhalation is sandpaper scratching at the back of my throat. With each exhale, a wheeze rises from my chest and exits as a smoke signal. Soon the landscape sparkles. I'm heading north, heading home, as insignificant as the snowflakes blanketing the fields. In all of that clear blue sky, not a bird, not a cloud. My mind wanders to the geese flocking the fields last fall on this same stretch of the number four. Low guttural sounds escaped as they stretched their necks toward the sky and lifted off just before the weather dipped. I honk the horn and wave at the lone tree. As I pass it by and head toward the horizon, my heart soars. This journey has become a flyway. Each landmark positioned against the horizon points me closer to home. <clears throat> I've often wondered how my ancestors survived prairie winters without electricity. There were no trees to burn for heat, no trees to break the cold north wind. I wonder if they dreamt of the briny coasts of Brittany. Perhaps it was the palette of prairie hues that kept them here. Most likely, it was because their options were as sparse as the trees. They must have noticed the geese packing up for winter and wished they too could fly away to warmer climates. The summer I was nine, my mother stuffed us and the camping gear into her AMC spirit. And we sped toward our first camping trip. Tropical suntan lotion, strawberry twizzlers, my mother's cigarette smoke, and the golden oldies wafted out our open windows. It was the first time we traveled north of the Trans-Canada. And until then, I'd only thought of trees as windbreaks. In the south, our farming ancestors planted trees in parallel lines to tame the raging prairie wind. With windbreaks, the wind transforms golden wheat into oceans and sculpts snow into glittering tidal waves. <clears throat> that day, we came across the mighty oak standing solo in a green field beneath the blazing blue sky, a yellow ribbon tied around its trunk. That tree left its stamp on me. Since then, solitary signifies strength rather than loneliness. Every time I pass the lone tree, I know I'm heading in the right direction. Maybe I've been home all along. Perhaps home is the journey and not the destination. They say home is where the heart is, and my heart is always reaching for the horizon. Then home must be the urge that pulls me toward the point where the sky caresses the earth. Or home could be somewhere between the push and pull of the wind, because each time I think I've sputtered out, it's the wind that comes along to reflate my withered lungs. It's the wind that inspires me. In French, my mother tongue, the word inspire means to breathe in. And the thought of breathing in the sky brings me closer to the truth of where home might be. <clears throat> Saskatchewan, land of the living skies. Look up and the sky will stamp you with its seal. The ever-changing tapestry is most striking at sunset or sunrise. That's when the atmosphere really comes to life. As with all natural beauty, there is science behind our skies. Visible light, the portion of the sun's radiation our eyes ingest, contains an entire color spectrum, and each color has a corresponding wavelength. 
As light exhales, particles scatter throughout the atmosphere. Blue, green, and violet, colors with shorter wavelengths, easily spread in all directions. By the time the distancing sun slips into the horizon, the blue and violet light has scattered, but the reds, oranges, and yellows of the sinking sun remain. The fire in the sky is often amplified by the setting sun's reflection in the cloud cover. Beware, the beauty of our skies might steal your breath away. How can I say I'm going home when I'm not sure where that is? When my family asks when I'm coming home, they want to know when I'm returning to my place of birth. My family assures me that home is where they are. They want me to call this place I have never felt I belonged home. The closest I've ever been to home was standing in my childhood pasture. When I close my eyes, I can taste home. Peppery dust with a subtle twist of sage and crocus. Home is standing beneath an enormous sky in a prairie field. That is where my heart slows and my lung capacity expands. Where the wind exhales the sunny smell of hay, the earthy aroma of alfalfa, and the sky's clear blue perfume of ozone. And with each breath, I inhale the boundless horizon. <clears throat> I sense the lone tree beyond the bend. It's just part it's just past that freshly harvested field where geese are grazing on the other side of the next row of caraganas. I smile and honk as I pass the lone tree. It sways its long limbs and propels me onward. I'm almost home. Suddenly, everything is as clear as the endless blue sky. They say geese fly in V formation for strength, like a flying windbreak. My family feels the gap of my absence, so they feel compelled to root me. I speed toward my family, my V formation. Looking up, I wonder how long the geese will stay before they leave for their home away from home. My truck flies down the number four. The geese must see a blue-gray blue dot sailing through this vast ocean of gold. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. And my second piece actually talks about science and the sky and the colors of Saskatchewan as well. <clears throat> but it's written about my angsty teenage son's teenage years. So for those of you who have teenagers, there is hope. <clears throat> this is called Remember the Magic. Remember the crimson smolder of my rage when the crude tedium of life lacking luster was too much or too little to bear. The echo of my fury knocked against the riverbank. This isn't how it was supposed to be, to be, to be. Your warm mittened hand melted anger into the tap dance of cinnamon hearts across my tongue. Round eyed, you exclaimed, Mama, there is magic all around us. Whoosh, the Chinook's hot breath pushed us forward and crackled the river ice. The drawbridge crumbled beneath our feet as we sped past dragons snapping at our draggling bones. We made it across in the nick of time and you yanked me through an enchanted archway. Sunlight sparkled through the glittering trees. Jeweled gypsies swirled mirrored skirts and ballerinas stretched long limbs as they crisscrossed the crystallized stage. Now I refuse your grown-up theories. You tell me, Mom, everybody knows that when sunlight varies, a plant hormone called auxin breaks down on the stem's sunnier side. That's why cells on the shady side grow longer. Trees only appear to bend toward the light. Sunlight winked and waved farewell that day. Don't you remember us waving back? Remember our house perched on the edge of the prairie? Anxiety, that indigo anvil, weighed on my shoulders while you slept. My mind smothered me with its litany of tasks left to do, laundry to fold, papers to correct, bills to pay, and a half-written thesis toppling off my desk. Wishing I had a cigarette, something to quell the panicked birds pecking at my chest, I sank into a cup of chamomile. I glanced up at the stars, and the sky stole my breath. 
The world stopped reeling as green and violet ribbons of light unfurled and stroked away my worry. When the lights disappeared, I exhaled. My magnetic lure feathered across the universe. Don't smirk while you explain. Mom, everybody knows the colors and complexity result from solar winds disturbing the magnetosphere. <clears throat> it's a scientific process whereby electrons and protons interact with the neutral atoms of the Earth's upper atmosphere. Instead, let's drive north, escape the city lights, and watch nature sweep her paintbrush across the sky. I should have woke woken you long ago. Too much time has been wasted on sleep. Remember the story I've been telling you since the dawn of your birth, back when days stretched like desert sands blowing toward eternity. One day you, a rainbow twinkle, burst over the floodgates and parasailed into the fertile basin of my womb. When you dropped your anchor, the copper tang of love exploded. Oh, what a rush. Love, a sultry tango, a baleo in my veins, transformed the muted colors of my existence into the scent of blazing blossoms. Obstacles pinwheeled out of sight and the world whirred and almost caught fire. That is when your heart began to beat inside of me. Stop saying you were the result of contraceptives gone wrong. My heart aches when you hand me statistics dripping with sarcasm. The year I was born, 111,526 women chose to abort. You could have added us to that statistic. Imagine how much easier your life would have been if I'd never been born. Search my eyes and you'll find your first home. The best bits of my life have been the least planned. You were the surprise party I never expected. A lucky raffle ticket to a dream destination. You, my son, are the twinkle that saved me from the hard facts of this world. Your creation was a whirlwind chance, a wild roulette. It was magic. Thank you. Hi, I'm Madonna Hamel, and I am going to be reading from a piece I wrote while I was at Stegner House in East End as their writer in residence. Um, and I performed it on Earth Day, so seeing as we were all uh, inside, I called it Hearth Day. So this is just a segment. If you find yourself in a strange and fearful time in a house with only a ghost for a host perched on the edge of your bed, Stretch yourself across the chasm of live streamed noise and listen to the streams of living things. Instead, hollered over choir of redemption, equipoised outside the window, the owl, the coyote in the hills, wind in the dry grass, rain against the windowsill, the voles in the ground, and not a single man-made sound. My friends in the big eastern cities envy me my western emptiness, more seclusion than isolation, with space enough between the few to still see the big view, to keep nature's artery open to more than meets the eye. Every morning I step out onto a landscape more alive than mine. But even in the city, I say, blocks from the nearest park, nature is no more than a foot away, compost in the kitchen, seeds in an egg carton, growing on into the dark, a spider web in the corner, jade plant in a clay pot, flame rising from a candle, a fire in the hearth, smoke rising from incense, tobacco or a smudge, steam rising from a kettle or a pot of boiling pasta. A beetle crossing the sidewalk, the cat asleep on the couch, sunlight passing over the pillow, the ground beneath the building, a living foundation, all of them elementals, living relations. There's no map for this. It's not what you planned. Anyone who's ever taken a trip or written a story understands, no matter how you strategize or plot and configure, at one point, in order to salvage the situation, in this case, your very life, you reach around for your pen and your pen knife. Start trimming fat from the bone. Start writing letters, please. Brotherly love poems. 
Maybe we can save ourselves with these half-remembered ritual words and gestures passed on from the dead, sacred if tarnished signals like the prairie benediction, two fingers lifted from the steering wheel, and that mysterious gift of a loaf of bread. And someone left a week's worth of lasagna on my front porch and a bottle of red. Behold, the language of neighbor chasing away the language of dread. Nothing clever, nothing fancy, no tricks to get your goat, no vying for ratings or ploys to win your vote, no jostling for position or promotion, and no more hard-hitting stories. Turn it off, you tell yourself, just for tonight. It just adds to the worry. If my mother were here, she'd holler from the kitchen, you kids go outside! Practice transcending the theater of the world and the limitations of your own doubt. Run with wonder just a little farther till the fear peters out. Every day is an exercise in realizing it matters the words we use. The shape that hope takes as it escapes your mouth is the shape of a little sail unfurled and the breeze that fills it. That's the slow breaking news from the subtle world. Breath of baby, screech of hawk, Sagebrush brushes against your skin, pungent saving grace you breathe it deeply in. An owl on the branch, who, who, shapes your sleep. Coyotes in all corners, a dog's bark down the street, the muscled blue roan. Solid, royal, untroubled as a stone, the call of geese and the sweet release of the slide guitar gliding across the room in a dream before I can answer, click, goes the answering machine. And it's gone, save for the song and the shimmering blue of the Rhone. Despite the collective anxiety of this time, the inescapable reality lurking outside my own hyperactive mind, despite the varying linguistic shades of daily confinement from monastery mode to on retreat, to quarantine, to lockdown, to isolated, to sheltering in, to burrowing in, to refinding refuge, despite the tumbleweed tumbling through the middle of town, Despite the shock of deprivation, incapacitation, and useless rationalizations, despite the time it takes to remember the childhood rituals, the calls for angels and animals across yards, rivers, between streets and over hills, despite the lost ancestral songs to quell internal encounters and external limitations, despite what I cling to and what I forget to keep, I'm having some great sleeps. Home is the place we head for in our sleep, writes Louise Erdick. Once the realm of poetry and prophecy, now dismissed as vaguely amusing and certainly not divinely inspired, limits our dreams to one per story now. Dreams are so old school, they're a last resort, the editors warn. You'll be sorry. But dreams spring up like flames in unknown times like these, like mushrooms, like weeds sown into our days so our nights are full. Our dreams return, mothers of others, and new dreams with recurring themes, and I stoop to hear their whispers like the old rabbis and the shamans did. In times of great upheaval, take note of your dreams, the old ghost says at the end of the bed. And listen, I still don't have a clue. Okay, maybe I have a clue what they're supposed to mean. I just know that part of this dance is just being willing to be seen. And what remains suspended in interpretation is motivation. It's that oddly wrapped gift of desperation. Dreams are prophets themselves, or once they were held that way, they see ahead of us. They know no fear. They do not speak in terms of limited time or hindered space. Theirs is the language of infinite associations where vitality meets grace. Together we've been tethered, ground to a halt. So why not start over together too? Instead of just dragging ourselves through a long piece, leaving behind fragments of an ineffectual shift with no real leap of transcendence or clarity achieved, what if we all slowed down on permanent reprieve from the rat race and the breakneck pace?
pace. No one gets a head start, no siphoning on the side, no one saving face. We set the bar at a saner height. We all take a month off every year and sleep a little longer every night. We all stay close to home, walk the shorelines and the hills, invite the neighbors over for a barbecue or cards or a puppet show because you always wanted a neighborhood where people get together and marvel at each other's potato salads and how fast the children grow. The old nightmares where we wandered alone in all the wrong places, well, they're everybody's weird dream now, and they don't go away when we wake. We can turn for solace to our devices, kill time like it's for our own good, or we can catch the sun setting over our neck of the woods. We can take to the hills where the dinosaurs roamed, where the deer and the antelope play, oblivious to the living and the dead. Where if ever is heard an encouraging word, we can take it and eat it like bread. Hello, I'm Diane Greenlee, and I'm the author of the Quint Spinner series, which is a fairly gritty historical pirate novel set. And I would like to thank both Terry and Gordon for inviting me to this Write Out Loud special digital episode that they're putting on in this time of COVID-19. I did speak to Write Out Loud a few years ago, uh, but when my first book was put out, the first book in the series was called Quint Spinner. That's the cover right there. And this evening, I am going to be reading from the second book in the series. I'm presently in the process of writing the third one. It's finished the first draft and just going through the um, editing phase, which is something that none of us really enjoy doing, I don't think. Anyway, I am from Shaunavon, Saskatchewan, and I not only write in the historical genre, but I also write in comedy, and I have a short story and a play both entitled The Camping Guy. I have dipped my toes in the romance swimming pool, so to speak, and have a few things written there that I, again, am in the editing stage for. And most recently, I have finished the first draft and am engaged with hiring a, an illustrator for a children's book series. So writing is something I really enjoy. Right now, it's a pastime for me. I find that my day job usually gets in the way of what I want to do with all of my hobbies and other interests. But I'm delighted to be able to read from book two tonight. It's entitled Deadly Misfortune. These books are set in the 1700s in the West Indies, which was the time, the golden age of piracy. And when I first began writing in this, it was because I'd done a Google search for some health term and in the search results up came women pirates. I'm not to this day sure why Google felt that that was necessary, but I didn't know that there were even such things as women pirates. Well, it turned out that there are and they have been really well documented. So I started reading up on them. I became quite obsessed with the way of life and how these women lived. And it was quite, quite a rough life for everybody, but particularly for the fairer sex. And I tried to make my novels as accurate as possible, including historically accurate. It was a rough life. It was very, very difficult, fraught with dangers. The medicine back then was what we would consider archaic or barbaric. And having done a lot of research, I tried to wind that into my novels, but make it so that it was not only a learning situation, but also something that was entertaining, so that it wasn't just dry and educational. And I was insecure having put my first novel up, so I entered it in several contests, 13 of them actually, and it either placed as a runner-up or won first in several different categories. So. I sort of felt compelled that maybe I should go on and continue the story. So that's what I've done. And I am um, pleased to announce that 
Deadly Misfortune has also won a couple of awards as well. So this story is very, very short chapters, although it's a reasonably um, length of, of novel. And I'll be reading from the first chapter for you this evening. Deadly Misfortune. This takes place in the 1700s in the West Indies. This is on an unnamed island. The man stared at the woman, momentarily caught off guard. She sat upon the ground, her torso resting against the moss-covered tree trunk, and his eyes roved over her. Such perfection. Attractive face with a small nose and plump lips parted slightly as though poised to speak. Cinnamon skin dabbled through the filtered sunlight in an intriguing pattern of tawny, dark, and gold. Thick tendrils of coal black hair curled softly over her bare shoulders, her breasts defiant and full in their youthfulness. Perfect. Except for the musket ball hole blasted squarely into her shattered breastbone. He blinked in surprise. Catching his breath, the hunter dropped into a crouch as he slid back into the protective camouflage of the jungle's foliage. He reassessed the scene, his heart pounding, all senses on full alert. Damn it! He cursed this part of his job. Competition. Incompetent fools. He was the best. Everybody knew it. And if he found this pretty little maroon first, he would have still had her to collect the bounty on and make no mistake about it. The bounty on this one would have been worth plenty, that was for sure. His annoyance at such a loss edged him towards a full-fledged temper fit. I could have kept her for myself for a little fun for a while anyways. Shit. What the bejesus happened here? She ain't even armed. She escaped with nothing more than the rags on her back. What a total frickin' waste. He shook his head. What was there to salvage? He tracked someone, well, something, from the plantation in the lower land. He'd trudged through this godforsaken hothouse. Who knew it was going to be so damned hot this far up the mountain? For nearly a full day he trudged, following subtle signs through the misery of clouds of biting insects. And finally, in his haste, he brushed up against clusters of some damn poisonous leaves that had caused his hands and arms to blister, only to come upon this disaster. He peered over at her corpse. Now all that he had to show for his time and effort was the tiny scrap of a baby, still cradled in the crook of her lifeless arm. Mewing brat. That is what had drawn him in this direction in the first place, only a heartbeat before the sound of the musket blast. And that suckling ain't going to last long neither, he grumbled to himself. Unless he could find a wet nurse back at the sugar mill, there wouldn't be any hope in hell. That thing would starve. And if it didn't quit bawling right now, he might just have to put it out of its misery himself. He squinted over at the baby, its tiny mouth stretched open in a primitive howl. And then he saw it. The sole of a boot. Tension crackled through him, the shock of his discovery hitting hard. No maroon this body. The boot's leather had been shaped by a reasonably skilled cobbler. Its style practically shouted bounty hunter to him. His rival, probably. He frowned, his forehead wrinkling up in confusion. What the hell had happened? Cautiously emerging from his hiding place, he stepped forward for a closer look and squinted down at his newest discovery. His eyes suddenly bulged with comprehension, the hairs on the back of his neck prickling with fear. His rival's shirt collar was wrapped around a bloodied stump of a neck, the slain hunter's head nowhere in sight. He had only a moment to consider this as the swish of a machete blade closed in around him. The sharp blow to his neck felled him and he pitched forward, dead before his own body crashed down upon the corpse at his feet. Part three. Laying down his machete and repositioning the baby boy in the dead woman's arm, Jacko held the infant in place while the child nursed greedily for what would be the last time at his mother's breast. When at last the child's belly was sufficiently full, Jacko dipped a moistened finger into a leather satchel tied at his waist and slipped the powdered fingertip into the baby's mouth, feeling the reflexive tug of the baby's suckling. The calming effect of the powder was nearly immediate, and he wrapped the now sluggish child in a chest sling before turning his attention to the young woman's body. Glancing at the clotting wound in her chest, white-hot grief stabbed in his own, and for a moment he clenched his eyes shut, dizzy with the effort to suppress his rage. 
Taking deep breaths, he forced himself to concentrate at the task at hand. It would not do to have any bodies found so close to the secret village. The bounty hunters had nearly discovered their small encampment of maroons only one more valley away from here. Making a separate trip with each head and corpse, he dragged them deeper into the underbrush. Limping heavily with the exertion, he recalled his own near death during an attack from the bounty hunter. The flesh on his own thigh and buttock had never fully recovered from the gunshot and knife wounds he had suffered at the hands of such a man, although he had miraculously lived through his injuries. Had it not been for his mate Mambo's potions and prayers to the gods, and he had to admit the healing powers of a white woman who called herself Tess, Jacko knew he would have been just another body left to feed the jungle spirits. He headed up the pathway, breathing up a prayer of thanks and a request for continued safety for himself and the village's people before rolling each set of body and head down into a steep crevasse at the bottom of a narrow ravine. Not even the dogs would be able to track the missing slave hunters any further. And they would come. He knew that. With more trackers. They always did. Finally returning to the remaining body, he bent down and gathered the woman in his arms. Holding her close, her child between them, he nuzzled her cheek with his own, inhaling deeply in an effort to capture her scent one last time. His nostrils flared and the crushing grief returned, scalding him as it bore deeper into his chest. She smelled only of death. Her spirit had left the body, but it would be hovering nearby, he thought, waiting for the appropriate rituals to be performed by Mambo. Without those, this woman's spirit would not be set completely free from the physical body, and it would be forced to roam in the darkness of night forever. Mambo, his mate, would know what to do to ensure that would not happen. She would ensure that this woman would not suffer such a fate. Mambo would release their daughter's soul. With a heart that was as heavy as the body he now carried across his shoulders, Jacko staggered deeply into the foliage and on up towards the hidden village. His sorrow drilled into his chest, morphing with every breath into a focused rage. It was time. That's chapter one of Deadly Misfortune. I hope you enjoyed the reading. Thanks again for having me here. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. A special thank you to Rachel, Diane, Madonna, and Harold for letting Baud Rate take a rest tonight and letting the power of our imaginations fly through theirs. Thank you for those beautiful words that keep us aloft in these difficult times. And thank you to Terry and the committee for making this all happen. And thank you and to the authors for videoing this and getting it to us. It's very difficult in our province in smaller communities. They don't have the speed of internet that we do in the larger communities. So we thank them for their persistence and patience in getting this to us. And uh, of course, thank you to Joey for putting all the pieces of video together. And um, thank you for watching tonight, ladies and gentlemen. And as we've said before, uh, we're going through uh, difficult times ourselves at the Lyric. Financially, most of our income uh, comes through box office, which we don't have right now. So if you can make a donation, we'd be most appreciative. Uh, it's uh, Lyric Theatre at um, box 1143, Swift Current, Saskatchewan, S9H3X3. Or if you want to e-transfer, it's uh, treasure at lyrictheatre.ca. So thanks again, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Stay tuned. Thanks.